Have you ever wished that you could click on things in the real world to find out more about them? What if you could learn about things around you in the real world without doing a search? You're at a bus stop. What if you could click on the stop to get the bus schedule? You see a poster. What if you could click on the poster so you can get more information? What if the real world behaved like the web? Well, it can. It's called the physical web. So I'm curious, how many of you have heard of the physical web before today? Just show of hands. OK, that's pretty good, actually, because the physical web is still kind of new. So what is this physical web? It's a bridge between physical things and the web. It allows you to walk up to anything and just use it. So that sounds a little magical, doesn't it? How does this actually work? So it starts with a beacon, something like this. It's broadcasting a URL. The Chrome browser on your mobile device is scanning for URLs nearby. When it finds one, it creates a notification. The user can then click on the notification and load the web page associated with that URL. The web page can present some information. And that web page also connect to the device, the beacon itself. Let's look at an example. So here we have a vending machine. We have a beacon associated with this vending machine. And the beacon is broadcasting a URL. And a notification is displayed to the user on the mobile device for that URL. It tells the user, hey, there's a vending machine nearby. You can buy candy. So the user clicks on the notification. It loads this web page with a big Buy button. And the user can then click on the Buy button. When that happens, the web page can communicate with the vending machine and say, hey, give some candy to this guy. So that's the user experience. But how do you, as a developer, implement a physical web solution? That's what this talk is about. So I'm going to cover several topics. Firstly, how to configure and deploy the beacons in the real world. How to provide the metadata for the notifications that are displayed to the user. How you can use progressive web apps to create native experiences. And then how to use the web Bluetooth API to control physical devices. So let's start at the beginning. So how do you actually configure and deploy a beacon in the real world? So we're going to look at some of the details. And some of this is based on our own experiences with deploying beacons in the real world. In fact, one of my colleagues, Scott, just recently deployed some beacons at the Computer History Museum, which is somewhere in that direction. And we learned some valuable lessons from that. Firstly, let's talk about Eddystone. So Eddystone is an open protocol specification for beacons. It defines a Bluetooth low energy meshing, messaging format for beacons. So the beacons are broadcasting URLs regularly, and any nearby applications can use that. So Eddystone defines several different types, frame types, that you can use individually or in combination. One of those frame types is called Eddystone URL. It allows you to broadcast a URL. That's what makes the physical web possible with a beacon. Now, Eddystone is supported by all the major beacon manufacturers, um, and it's growing. And Eddystone is, oh, Eddystone is also compatible with Apple's uh, iBeacon format. OK, let's look at some of the gory details. So this is an advertising packet, the actual bytes that make up the advertising packets for the Eddystone URL frame. So this is what gets broadcasted by the beacon on a regular basis. So you can see that we're broadcasting a URL from the Google URL shortener. But you can use any shortener. The, the URL is compressed to fit within the limited advertising packet size, which is only 18 bytes for the URL. Now, these advertising packets are broadcasted, and any devices or applications nearby can extract useful information from that. So let's talk about Chrome. 
Now, as I said, Chrome in the background is scanning for URLs nearby. When it gets the URL, it sends it up to the cloud to a proxy service. The proxy service does several things. Firstly, it eliminates the duplicates. It avoids spam. And it also does some ranking of the URLs. Now, the scanning is done in the background in a very efficient manner. It doesn't drain your battery for your mobile device. And once the proxy server has actually processed all these URLs, they are sent back to Chrome. And then Chrome makes a notification out of that. Other browser vendors are also working on their own scanners to do something similar. OK, you've bought an Edison beacon from any of the manufacturers that support the standard. How do you actually configure that beacon for the physical web? Well, you start by um, configuring the frame type. So typically, a beacon vendor will give you a native app that allows you to configure their particular beacons. So you open that, uh, that app, you configure the frame type. You will then get prompted to specify the URL. There are some requirements for the URL. In particular, for the physical web on Chrome, we only support HTTPS for security reasons. And as I mentioned before, um, you've got to use a URL shortener because there's only a limited number of bytes that you can put into the advertising packet. Now, the other advantage of using a URL shortener is that you can do URL redirects. So you can configure all your beacons with this shortened version of the URL, and then at any time go to the cloud and change the URL redirect without having to go back to the beacons and reconfigure them. So it's very valuable. A few more parameters you need to configure, again, using the configuration app. The first one is the transmission power. Now, we recommend a value somewhere between negative 30 dB and negative 35 dB. And um, so that's a low setting for the transmission power. It has uh, two advantages. One, it helps to prolong the life of the battery for the beacon. Secondly, it ensures that users only see the beacons when they're close to the beacon. So this gives, you, gives the user a much more contextual experience. Now, of course, there are going to be situations where you need to extend the transmission power, have a higher value. And I'll talk about some of those use cases later. The next parameter that you need to set is the advertising frequency. We recommend the value of 700 milliseconds. So that means every 700 milliseconds, the beacon is advertising the data. Now, scanning applications such as Chrome might not reliably show these URLs as notifications if this frequency is slower than a second. So this is really important. What you need to do is, once you've configured your beacons, is go and actually try this under real-world conditions. And you might have to tweak some of these parameters. If these beacons are not configured correctly, the user experience might not be good. They might walk past your beacon and never get a notification. OK, you've configured the beacon. How do you actually physically deploy the beacon in the real world? Now, the complexity of your deployment will depend on two things. Firstly, how many beacons you need to deploy. And secondly, how many distinct URLs you need to support for your particular application. So this table shows the various combinations, and we'll go through those. The, the first one is really the easiest one, is where you've got one beacon and one URL. So that's like a poster. And the poster has a link to a trailer for the movie, for example. We recommend a low setting for the transmission power. Put the beacon at a high altitude so there's less interference. Also try and avoid any metal. The next one is many beacons, one URL. So that's like having an agenda at a conference. That's exactly what we've done here at I.O. So I'm sure you've seen on your phone that there's uh, notifications coming up for the I.O. agenda. Now, of course, this is a large area. So we need a lot of beacons to cover the area. So here we recommend you actually increase the transmission uh, power for the beacon to cover a larger area. Now, for physical web scanners like Chrome, when they see multiple URLs in the same area, it will be deduplicated. So even if there's overlap between the transmissions, the user will only see one URL. So the next one is many beacons, many URLs. Now, the use case for this is like an exhibition. Um, maybe like a museum. So you have a large building, but a lot of individual items. And you want to give each item its own URL. 
So in this case, you want to restrict the range in which the user will actually discover the URL for every object as, as they walk around. So you can do this by lowering the transmission power of the beacon. OK. You've configured the beacons. You've deployed the beacons. Now, how do you actually provide the metadata for those notifications that get displayed to the user? Now, the physical web is an open ecosystem. So any browser can implement support for it. But we're going to focus on Chrome's implementation. So let's take a look at the notifications. You can see that for every URL discovered, um, we see an icon, some kind of image. We see a title. We see a description. And of course, the URL that was discovered. But where is this coming from? Well, remember, after Chrome has collected the URLs nearby, it's taking the shortened URL, expand it into the full URL, sends it up to the proxy service. The proxy service actually goes and visits every one of those URLs. It then extracts the metadata it needs. And I'll go into the details of uh, what that is. Once it's got the metadata, it sends it back down to Chrome. And then Chrome caches it locally on the mobile device and uses that for the notification um, presentation. One note that on, uh, for Chrome, at least, the physical web is not enabled by default. So the first time a Chrome discovers a physical web URL nearby, it actually shows an introduction to the feature. It tells the user about the physical web. And it also asks permission to enable the feature. So only if the user says yes, then they will get subsequent notifications about nearby URLs. OK, so how do you optimize your website for these notifications, for the metadata? Now, these are all based on standard HTML concepts. And I'm going to show you an example of this too. Firstly, you need an HTML title. You're going to need a description meta tag. You need an icon of at least 96 by 96 pixels. So where is that number coming from? Well, we've did, done some testing. And anything lower than that doesn't really look good as a notification on most mobile devices. So at least that dimension. Now, if you don't provide the title or the description meta tag, you can also use schema.org or open graph tags to provide that metadata. We're also considering the use of a web app manifest for some of the metadata. It's not there yet, but will be coming soon. OK, so what does this mean? Well, here's the most basic HTML to provide all the metadata we need for a notification. It's really quite simple. So you can see we have the title, we have the description, we have a reference to the icon, and a reference to the web app manifest. This is standard web stuff. Let's look at the app manifest. In particular, we're interested in two of those uh, values, the name and the set of icons. So this is just a JSON file that shows you the metadata about the web app. Um, this is not particular to physical web. This is just part of the web standards. Um, the nice thing about the icons is that it shows uh, multiple resolutions. So that's very useful for sh showing uh, different um, resolutions on the mobile devices. OK. So now you've got your website ready for the notification, right? You've provided all the metadata. When the user clicks on their notification, your web page is then loaded. Now, one of the criticisms of web apps is that the user experience and the set of features that are possible from a web page might not match that of a native app. In particular, when it comes to things like usability or responsiveness, might not be as good as a native apps. Well, that's actually no longer true. And we're going to look at how we can use progressive web apps to create native experiences for users. So let's take a look, just a quick look at what progressive web apps are. Firstly, it supports a full screen mode for your web app. Your app can be added as an icon to the home screen. So the user can launch it directly there without using the browser directly. It supports push notifications. It has an application cache. In fact, you can cache the entire application, the framework, the data, everything locally on the mobile device. And that's great because you can do something called offline support. So literally, when your mobile device is not connected to the internet in any way, you'll still be able to launch this app. And the user will not see any error messages, 
no HTTP error codes, it will launch like it is connected to the internet. So support for progressive web apps are being implement, implemented by Chrome, Firefox, and Opera. Progressive web apps are a really great example of leveraging existing web technologies for a new use case. OK, let's take a look at a, a, an example. This is a progressive web app. You can see that the user is loading it from a URL. Then it's added to the home screen as an icon. And once you launch it from that icon, it launches full screen. There's no address bar. And to the user, it actually looks like a native app. So that's quite different from a normal web page. So this is an example of a great progressive web app from a physical web point of view. And, and the reason is that this particular app is single purpose. So in this case, it actually allows you to press a button. Now, ideally, when you design a web page for the physical web, you should cater to a single action. Remember, the user just clicked on the notification for that beacon. The user has shown an intent to interact with that beacon or device. So the user is not browsing to this page or won't be browsing inside the page. So ideally, focus on providing either a simple action or a single page of content that is associated with that beacon or device. OK, so you have a web app. How do you make it progressive? There's actually just three things you need to do. It's quite simple. Firstly, you need to add something called the service worker. So has any of you heard of a service worker before? OK, just some of you. OK, a service worker is uh, something quite new. Um, very exciting technology, though. What it does, it's like running a script in the background for your website. Chrome does this on your behalf. Now, uh, the main use case for a service worker, one of the main use cases, is um, to do caching. So you, once you've configured the service worker, you can configure it so it can automatically cache your framework and data um, behind the scenes. And that makes the offline support uh, possible. Now, there are various libraries and frameworks, like Polymer, that allows you to easily add this to your existing web app. So this is not a big effort. The second requirement, you have to use HTTPS. Now, as I mentioned before, for the physical web um, scanner on Chrome, we only support HTTPS, so you have to do that anyhow. Then the third thing you have to do is you have to provide the web app manifest. So again, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking into supporting the web app manifest for some of the metadata. So there's a nice overlap between the requirements of the physical web and progressive web apps. Now, those are just the basics, actually. There's a lot more to progressive apps. But that's basically all you need for this particular use case, for the physical web. Um, there are things that you can provide for configuring the offline support. Um, there's more things you can do with the service worker. There's a growing number of libraries and frameworks and some great sample apps. In fact, there's been several sessions here at I.O. about progressive web apps. So if you're interested in exploring opportunities to make your web app be more native, then definitely go and look at those resources. We've also announced um, more frameworks that support uh, progressive uh, web apps, and also a lot more content partners that are now uh, developing progressive web apps. OK. So we've configured beacons. We've deployed beacons. We've got the metadata. The user is clicking on our notification because we've got something that is enticing, and the user wants to interact with that particular device or beacon. So now that the user has actually loaded the web page from a Bluetooth device, your page can actually communicate back to that Bluetooth device. And you can do that using an API called the Web Bluetooth API. So I'm going to show you my very first Web Bluetooth API application. Can we play the video, please? So here's my Chromebook. I've got a, a web app there, and there's, some, uh, there's a control panel. And there's Grumpy. Grumpy is attached to some helium balloons. And I've got a little uh, Bluetooth controller on there. And this controller is interesting in that it has a, a little propeller. <laughs> I 
and we're going to see if we can make Grumpy fly. So uh, this particular device has, um, has a way for you to control the speed of the uh, propeller and uh, the rudder. You control the direction left and right. So here I'm first connecting to the device. Now that it's connected, I can make Grumpy do stuff. What are we going to do? So I'm just setting the, the rudder, and I'm starting the little engine, and you should see Grumpy start moving. Can you see the little propeller going there? <laughs> it was really tricky uh, uh, controlling this. The, uh, it's not that easy to move it around. But they, you get the idea, poor Grumpy. Grumpy's, Grumpy is flying. So that's all doing uh, basically Bluetooth from a web page directly to a device. OK, so let's talk about this magic. What is the Web Bluetooth API? So the Web Bluetooth API is a specification that allows you to talk from a web page to a device in a very secured way. And secondly, it allows you to communicate and control devices using Bluetooth low energy. So this is a standard Bluetooth low energy that, that's been around for a while. Now, on web pages that use this API, the user actually gets prompted to select the device to connect to. Now, that's a little awkward for the physical web use case, because remember, the user has clicked on the notification. If they go to a page, and then we prompt the user again to connect, when the user has already kind of indicated an intent to talk to that device. So we're working on uh, a solution for that, an update that will come soon, that will actually avoid that. So if the notification launches a page that then goes to the web page, uh, or to the device, um, we won't show that chooser to the user. So it's a seamless experience. But at the moment, it does show that. Now, this is actually a very exciting API. It's a lot of fun to play with. And previously, the only way you could do Bluetooth is to have a native app. Now you can do it from the web. OK. So previously, remember, I told you that when you had to configure a beacon, you had to use the configuration app from the beacon manufacturer. It's a native app, typically. Well, now that we have the Web Bluetooth API, can't we use that to configure the beacon? And the answer is yes, we can, actually. So there's something called the Edistone URL configuration service. It allows you to set the Edistone URL uh, parameters and transmission characteristics that we looked at earlier. This web app here at that URL was written by one of my colleagues, Francois. And well, he, he lets you co fully configure all the parameters you need for the physical web, and it's using the Web Bluetooth API. So this is really great, because now you can use this single web app to go and configure any beacon from any manufacturer that supports this configuration service. Very nice. Uh, now, the Web Bluetooth API in this particular app works on Chrome OS. Um, it works on Chrome for Android M. It works on Chrome for Linux. And we're working on support for Windows and Mac OS X. We want this to work everywhere. OK, let's look at code. So how do you use the API? The API is actually very easy. So the first section of the code, we're providing a, what's called the filter. And we're basically telling um, the scanner for the Bluetooth devices that we're interested in a device nearby that's supporting a service called the Warp Engine service. OK, so Chrome will find it. It'll show a list to the user. The user picks it from the chooser. And once the user has selected it, the rest of the code is, is run asynchronously. The first thing we need to do is actually can make the connection. Um, and then we do two more things. We try and find a service. In this case, we are trying to find the warp engine service. And once we've got the warp engine service, we can get the warp factor characteristic. Now, the terminology I'm using here is all standard Bluetooth low energy concepts. This is not particular to the web Bluetooth API. Of course, the warp engine is not a standard service. Once we've got the characteristic, we can read values from that characteristic. In this case, we're reading the warp factor value from that characteristic. The API also allows you to write values to the beacon. 
and it has um, a mechanism to notify your code asynchronously when values change. So as you can see, very simple. This is it. This is the working code. The rest of it is just making the UI. So it's very simple, but very powerful. And this works with any device that supports BLE. Let's look at another cool demo. So I wrote a sample app that allows you to control uh, a Swedo toy. And one of my colleagues, Matthew, took this to the next level with this really awesome web app. So I'm going to do a demo. Can we switch to the demo, please? OK, hope you can make that out. OK. So uh, this is a web page. Um, and when you load the page, it actually prompts you to connect to a device. So let's try and do that. And there is the chooser. And what are we choosing? Well, we're choosing Oli. So Oli is a Bluetooth device. So that happens to be its ID. And now we're going to pair it. So we're pairing it, and then the code is connecting. It's running basically that code that I showed you. Of course, not the same characteristics. And so to show you this, I'm going to put it here. And hopefully you can see it. So I'm going to use the UI to do some interesting things to Ollie. So there I'm changing the colors. And I'm going to do something very dangerous. I'm going to actually try and move Ollie. Scary. OK. Hope you get the idea. <laughs> so Ollie is actually uh, designed to run around, but I'm not going to make it run around. I'm thinking I'm going to freak out the cameraman. So uh, what I did there was just use the controller here to move Ollie. And so it's turning around as I'm adjusting the controller and then the color. There's a little color wheel to go and change the color of the device. OK. Can we go back to the slides, please? Um, here's some other Web Bluetooth APIs that I, or apps that I created. Uh, they're all open sourced on GitHub. So there's a racing car. There's a a little printer and a little um, LED device. Um, now, these are all off-the-shelf devices. No hacking required. They support BLE. Go and have fun. OK, so now you know how to implement a physical web solution, right? We've covered all the aspects of it. But why? Why would you want to do a physical web solution? What are the opportunities for you as a developer? Now remember, Eddystone is an open protocol. Everything about Eddystone and the physical web has been open sourced. All of our code is sitting on GitHub. Go and take a look. The physical web works across multiple beacons, multiple browsers, multiple operating systems. Everything that I showed you today doesn't require you to use anything from Google. Now, the physical web is also ideal for long tail applications. Your user doesn't have to download an app and install it. You don't have to maintain that native app. The user experience for uh, the physical web is also consistent. It's always there's a notification. The user clicks on the notification. It loads a web page. The web page can do amazing things now. So that's great from a, a user education point of view. Now, since you can do Bluetooth from a web page, now you have opportunities you didn't have before because it opens up the whole growing IoT market to you now as a developer. You don't need to build native apps to control embedded devices anymore. So let's do a recap. The physical web is an open, new, intuitive ecosystem. It's all based on open standards. We have Eddystone, which is an open beacon messaging format. You can control Bluetooth devices, Bluetooth LE. Eddystone beacons can be configured to support URLs. They're broadcasting the URLs, and anybody around it can pick it up and do what they want with that. That makes the physical web possible. Various browsers and operating systems are uh, implementing support for this and scan for the URLs nearby. 
And when the user clicks on notifications for those URLs, it loads a web page. That web page can be loaded by any browser, not just Chrome. So this is really a very exciting area to explore and very easy to get started. So what's next? Well, go and play. It's a lot of fun. You have everything you need to be able to do this yourself right now. So here are some useful links. We've got a lot of stuff on GitHub. It's still very early days for this technology, so we'd love to get your feedback. Um, your feedback can actually have an impact on the direction in which this technology will go. And now the main reason you're here, of course, is the free stuff. Um, so we're handing out some uh, test beacon this afternoon. It's in the uh, mobile web sandbox. Uh, it's somewhere in that direction. Uh, so these are test beacons, and they've been loaded with uh, firmware that supports that Eddystone configuration service that I mentioned before. So you can go to that web page and go and configure that beacon.